ladies and gentlemen, may the Lord be with you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. O oh, Father, tonight I come personally to ask you to guide our government in the right direction, as they may not be astute enough to channel their energies in the right direction. May they come to the realization that doing business with China is not in the country's benefit on the whole. O oh, Father, bless the little children who are so innocent as to what is to come, because we have not made way for them. Bless the sick, the disabled, and the old in our midst. Give them the health and strength to overcome their disabilities, and to feel that they are part and parcel of this pristine land of ours. I therefore ask you to send the Holy Spirit to guide us all, more so the government. I know that anything and everything is possible because you are the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Amen. Now to my social comment. Tonight I quote from Chirac, chapter 2, verse Verses 1 to 18. Son, if you are going to serve the Lord, be prepared for times when you will be put to the test. Be sincere and determined. Keep with the Lord. Never abandon Him, and you will be prosperous at the end of your days. Accept whatever happens to you, even if you have to suffer humiliation. Be patient. Gold is tested by fire, and human character is tested in the furnace of humiliation. Trust the Lord, and He will help you. Walk straight in His ways, and put your hope in Him. All you that fear the Lord, wait for Him to show you His mercy. Do not turn away from Him, or you will fall. All that you that fear the Lord, trust Him, and you will certainly be rewarded. All you that fear the Lord, look forward to His blessings of mercy and eternal happiness. Think back to the ancient generations and consider this. Has the Lord ever disappointed anyone who put his hope in Him? Has the Lord ever abandoned anyone who held Him in constant reverence? Has the Lord ever ignored anyone who prayed to Him? The Lord is King and merciful. He forgives our sins and keeps us safe in times of trouble. But those who lose their nerve are doomed. All those sinners who try to have it both ways, doom is sure to come for those who lose their courage. They have no faith, and so they will have no protection. Doom is sure to come for those who lost their hope. That will, will, what will they do when the Lord comes to judge them? Those who fear the Lord do not disobey His commands. Those who love Him will live as He wants them to live. Those who fear the Lord and love the Lord will try to please Him and devote themselves to the law. Those who fear the Lord are always ready to serve Him. They humble themselves before Him and say, We place our destiny in the hands of the Lord, not in the hands of men, because His mercy is as great as His majesty. Tonight I chose this passage because it is relevant in our lives, but for me, that last, the last few lines meant, meant a lot. That is what I live by especially in a country where the dependency culture seems to be so endemic that both political parties suffer from it badly. None, in my view, have an ideology but that dependency culture. Well, those few lines that says those words are, who fear the Lord are always ready to serve Him. They humble themselves before Him. This I do regularly, but where I, it says that we place our destiny in the hands of the Lord, not in the hands of men, because His mercy is as great as His majesty is, something I believe deeply or believe in deeply. I will humble myself to no man and to no party, but only to God. This week I have been looking at something which my daughter sent me because she had chosen the piece to write on in her first degree, and it was called Latin America, Dependency and Super Exploitation by Adrian Sotelo Valencia. He was looking at dependency theory in the tradition of Roy Moro Marini. There is no doubt that only an academic mind will be able to break down the points that are being made. However, the part that really caught my eye was in the conclusion when he said that in the final analysis, the super exploitation of labor, the specialization of production, the concentration of income and employment, misery and exclusionary policies of the Latin American capitalist state, formerly democratic, is really rooted in counterinsurgency and authoritarian power structures. Configure the perverse features of a structural dependency that is opposed to the demands for democratization by Latin American workers and popular classes who demand greater participation in the decisions that affect their lives. Well, I had to say that under both the last Labour government and this present 
government. We have seen the failures to understand the importance of having consensus and to engage those whose lives will be affected by the decisions they make. Can it be that politicians who get elected just seem to want to go back to this dependency culture that has decimated small countries and middle countries as we have seen in Latin America, especially Brazil? I lecture on two courses at the Open Campus, UWI, Supervisory Management and Advanced Supervisory Management, the psychology of management. I always make the point to my students, future managers and those who are managing at present, that the best managers try at all times to practice what we call EE, which is employee engagement, because successful businesses around the world are those who adopt employee engagement. Therefore, when people's lives are affected in their constituencies, they should have a say in what takes place. This we are not seeing at present. This government, for instance, when they came into power, stopped nearly all the ongoing projects that were being done under the Labour Party without consulting any of the local people. That attitude, in my view, cannot be good for democracy. I do believe this, that is what we practice in this country and it is rooted in what is termed counterinsurgency and authoritarianism. Engagement should take place on major issues, especially when none of the parties are imbued with any form of ideology. On this score, it is very difficult to separate one party from the other. Over the years, we have seen that dependency culture getting out of hand because some idiotic politicians believe that by being voted into power, they become gods and are unanswerable to no one. We see idiots, even though they say they have masters or PhDs, are blatant bookworms without any common sense. Many are completely ineffective in developing an idea or a plan. They are without a doubt poor leaders because they possess no leadership qualities. Some talk the talk, but cannot put any of the things they talk about in practice. However, as we have seen, they are very good at bringing the level of debate to the gutter level by the horrible party gathering in which, for example, the Star Prize was given to Labour. In watching the first part of this char uh, charade, sorry, I thought that the pantomime season had begun and that it was December until I saw the spectacle that was supposed to make me laugh and to make me think was repugnant to all my senses because the target it was aiming at left a lot to be desired. The few minutes I watched were simply gutter politics, frivolous and macabre, complete trash, so I decided to switch off. In fact, I thought I was coming from, I, it was coming from the Labour Party, who was supposed to have a toilet mine. How in heaven's name can I ever res have respect for that lady or, or someone to follow? I am not saying so because of my personal feelings. I've gone out and made a survey and no one, not one person was happy with this disgusting piece of gutter soap opera. Enough said on that sad episode of my party's debacle. However, tonight, I want to make a special plea to all those who believe in a civil society that we should be making an attempt to get together, to monitor and to speak on issues that are of some importance to the government and the people of this pristine land. There are those in government, and I have lots of proof, how some in high places do their utmost to remove people in certain positions they don't like or who are too honest with the truth. When this government was elected, I had so much faith in them because of what we had gone through and thought that we would be bringing a divided country together. Instead, we seem even more divided today. Those in power may not like me for saying so, but it is, to, I say to them, and I want them to remember that in 1998 and beyond, everybody thought that the UWP party was dead and buried. It was people like Stevenson King and myself Nicholas John, and a few others that kept the fire burning. We came together to put the party's new constitution at the time together. There was also others like Judge Lorraine Williams, and the leader then, Vaughan Lewis. And when Morella took over the leadership, Steve became the chairman and was located above Napa, where at present a certain doctor has his office. When I look back at some who were strong liberites then, and who seem to have now become the power brokers of the party, I mean the UWP party, are there for their own personal reasons and now want to shut others out because they fear them. 
What is remarkable in my case is that just a few days ago, I got an email from a terrific ambassador, Tom Chu, who spent five years in St. Lucia, and he thanked me for those five years because he admitted to me that he took advice from me as to how best to help my country, and without me, less would have been done. I therefore stand tall that I have done nothing for gain. Once again, I bow to no man but God. Even on issues dealing with the environment, I've never been asked to participate in anything that, in that field, yet I'm qualified. And in 1997 and beyond, I was called Mr. Environment because I was the first taking that seriously, especially pollution, global warming, and climate change to the school children. My first book was called Nature Watch, an environmental toolkit for Caribbean schools. I'm pointing this out because the past and present government fear those who will not bow or stoop to their level and lie for them. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth is always the truth. I believe that many of us should now be beginning to look very carefully at what takes place at the political level because there is a tension between democracy and the growing propensity to political authoritarianism. This is what was taking place in this country under the last government and now this present government. There is very little difference in the way they govern. They seem to forget about honesty, tolerance, regardless of party affiliations and above all, the rule of law. They love to break the law when they want just to spite someone they dislike or fear. This has become a disease that is now endemic in that those in government refuse to take advice or respect peck any some or someone who sees things differently to them, especially if you, are of, if you are of their party. What they seem to profess is that they are always right and therefore one should not question their decisions. They take a dislike to you even though you worked your butt off to get them elected. The power gets to their head. The PM and others in cabinet must learn to take criticisms because, especially when it is from their own, they must not see those individuals as a threat, but those who want to help. I've said this many times before. What many at the head of the party fail to realize or understand is that this is a democracy. And therefore, we have freedom to think, freedom of speech, freedom to come together, freedom of religion, etc. These are sacrosanct to us. Many who come into power would love to turn this democracy into a totalitarian society where only those in government have the right to speak. Some now want to convince us that they have an MBA which probably was given to them and therefore have adopted this inflated ego about themselves. They immediately want to show us how well educated and knowledgeable they are, simply forgetting there are others far more educated and sensible, but they are not the only ones. They have a, these people have a worldwide experience that they can never emulate and yet are humble people. Men and women of that ilk think that they are not answerable to anyone. They simply forget about ethics and integrity. In fact, they don't even know it exists. They live on a knife's edge, just thinking of themselves and a few friends. Well, we must bring an end to this charade because St. Lucians will never develop as long as those people control our destiny, civil society, I plead with you to wake up because our country needs us. What I'm observing at present is that the moral principle, we have lost that moral principle that have been lost and their distinctiveness have gone. Therefore, I say to every man or woman that you must decide whether you'll walk in the light of creative altruism or the darkness of destructive selfishness that seems so prevalent at this moment in time. This is a judgment for me. Therefore, life's most persistent and urgent question is what are these politicians doing for the nation that we so love? That is why I believe that we, that it is by searching into and beyond ourselves and tapping the transcendent ethic of love, we shall overcome those evils. Love, truth, and the courage to do what is right should be our own guidepost on this lifelong journey. I also believe that the search for a better life has always been a fundamental prince, percept, or precept sorry, of humanity, but only in a truly free democratic society can this precept be something more than a myth. Many of us cannot remain silent 
as our government continues to languish into no man's land. Those of us who want a country to be proud of must organize as effectively as we can. We must combine our energies to demonstrate, teach and preach until the very foundations of this country is shaken. We must work unceasingly to lift the country that we so love to a higher destiny, to a new plateau of compassion, to a more noble expression of humaneness and above all, one where the government will listen to the voices of civil society. Once again tonight, I've tried to be honest because to be honest is to confront the truth regardless how unpleasant and inconvenient that it may be. This is what I believe, that we must expose and face it if we are to achieve a better quality of life for all solutions. I do so believe because the generations to come will have a decent life, which means security, good health, education, and jobs. What I have noticed is that many of us measure success by what is done for us personally instead of what is done for the nation as a whole. I know that we must have patience because every new government confronts overwhelming problems, but this government must come to the realization that their first two years has, has now approached or is approaching and the citizens are still lost as to what direction they are heading. They must also bear in mind that the country does not want the opposition back as they are not ready and will not be for a long time. However, the Barbados election result must send a message to us all that we can tolerate so much and no more. Therefore, a civil society group coming together can form the next government and I want to be part of that group if this government fails to achieve what they promised because of poor leadership. I will still give the government the three years that they have asked for and is prepared to give them my support. However, this support cannot continue if pleasant mistakes are being made time and time again and arrogance prevails. Finally, I want to say to the government, look a little bit more deeply on their favorite investor, T.U.R. King, because while in Taiwan on my fellowship, I did some research on him. And what I have found out is that he works for the Chinese government. The SH is one half of an organization that comes under the Bank of China. And above the Bank of China is the Chinese Communist Party. Since coming back in 2016, I've searched the internet for the full information that I found in Taiwan, but have been unable to do so. However, I wrote everything down luckily. Yes, it is true that he was born in Malaysia. He lives in Tianjin, China. And yes, there is a race course, but it is for private members. And it is also hopefully a breeding for, it is also hopefully for breeding top horses, even from Ireland. The first of its kind in China. Therefore, for this to happen here, an equine facility is necessary of the highest quality that will satisfy international standards. I leave the rest to your imagination. I therefore hope and pray that we are aware, all aware, because I'm not in favor of Chinese taking over our country as they have done in many other countries of the world. We have had in the past set one set of colonials who were the Europeans. We certainly don't want Chinese as a second because their whole persona is a dislike for blacks because they feel themselves superior to us. Go to Africa and we will see what obtains. I therefore hope and pray that all solutions will be aware of the, these facts and we will come to our senses and realize that Taiwan is our best friend, our best bet as diplomatic friends. I still have faith that we will see the light and that the Holy Spirit will come to our aid because, after all, he is the one most high, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. Amen, amen. On behalf of Calabash Television, the management, the admin staff, the technicians, and my fortune, and Denise, who is due home soon from her studies, beautiful Daniela, gorgeous and Princess Dan, and the Prince himself, Dimitri, I bid you a pleasant weekend in Geova. A good night to you. Good night and good night.